Welcome to the BLK FLA experience. We are the cultural archive for the Black political movement in the state of Florida, where our purpose is to help you reimagine a Florida where Black people are able to live in freedom, equity, and authenticity. I'm your host, Jamal Still, and we're taking this time to dive into all things Black politics and Black culture. Let's get into it. We are in episode five. So this, this, this episode five, I am very much thankful and grateful to the other four guests that have come on the show, including our most recent guest that came on um, two Thursdays ago, the incomparable and the incredible State Representative Michelle Rayner. Um, we had a good time. We had a good conversation. Um, shout out to everybody that's reached out to me from that episode um, around the Rico Way tribute that we did on the episode around the conversation around the Black church and how to re-engage in Black political matters, all the things. So, you know, we did, we, we had a good time. Next up on our show, though, um, is another awesome, great, great friend of mine. And I keep telling y'all, like, these people are like actual friends. There's not no, no Hollywood business. I really kick it with these people on, the, on, on a consistent basis. This next gentleman that's coming into the forefront, he is an organizer with Florida rising i'm gonna let him give y'all y'all title because it's like really important and i just you know it'd be best if he gave it to you than i did um he also though was a former state representative as well as a former state senator here in the state of florida uh and just an all-around dope dude just all around dope dude down in down in the miami area down in the in the trio five as the as the kids like to say um y'all give it up for the white buller what's going on my guy how you doing <laughs> what's going on jamal I always uh always a pleasure to be in your presence i uh, appreciate the invitation happy to be lucky number five on the show and i hope i hope i hold uh the standard up that you've created <laughs> uh, so far no, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And um, I appreciate you accepting the invitation to come on. So we are going to go ahead and get right into it, jump right into it. So, of course, as everyone knows, our first segment on the show is the What We Talking About segment. This is the segment where we dive into either a crucial event in Black politics or a crucial event and Black culture, um, and framing from, you know, Black perspective, there's still going to be some sort of, like, political nuances that can be discussed whenever we touch on any any sort of perspective. So, Dwight, you're, you're literally going to be the first person that is going to participate in this What We Talking About segment that is actually going to have a conversation from the Black cultural perspective because everyone else it's literally been it's literally been black po politics shout out to yeah. shout out to rep angie nixon um we did our episode it literally was the end of it literally was three days after session ended so we talked about session all of the horrors of session um when sean shaw came on the show we just talked about Black men, how do we get black men engaged in politics and reconnect them? Um, Rep. Rayner, when she came on the show, it was about it was out the black church and getting the black church reconnected. White, there is a matter that we have to discuss. So let's talk about it. We both are pretty big fans of hip hop. 
Um, no, nobody really knows this, so I'm gonna put people up on some on some game. Dwight and I are what you call IG meme buddies, I, IG meme friends, which is <laughs> anything that we see on IG, we're probably gonna share it with each other. Um, and there has that that has been a consistent thing within the last couple of days and weeks because of two particular men, <laughs> Aubrey Graham and Kendrick Duckworth. You all know affectionately know them as Drake and Kendrick Lamar. Listen, so this this all started uh, honestly. So casual fans feel like this all started with "Like That," the song that Kendrick Lamar is featured on on um, Young Metro Boomin and Future's Fu Future's classic album. <laughs> um, we don't believe you. So. Everybody feels like it started then. It did not, people. Let's 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 be perfectly clear. This has been a thing that has been going on. I would say probably a little bit after Good Kid, Mad City, going into to Pimp a Butterfly. Um, when Take Care came out, um, I think Drake has a song on Take Care called "The Language." Um, a lot of that particular song, a lot of things that were said in that song was about Kendrick Lamar. This has been a thing. And more so because of the fact of a song that Big Sean put out that was supposed to be on his album but did not pop up on the album, known as Control. Control had Big Sean, J Electronica, and this rapper guy from Compton by the name of Kendrick Lamar in this song, <laughs> in said song, Kendrick Lamar states that rappers that were named in his verse, I want your core fan base, the core fan base, not the casual people that just listen to your songs every now and then when they pop up in the club or when they in the car and it's on the radio. No, your core fan base, the day ones, the people that knew you when you were still out here putting out mixtapes on Two Dope Boys, Nami, um, and all of the other various various blogs. Shout out to Kevin Nottingham, shout out to Nami, shout out to Two Dope Boys. That was an era of hip hop all in, all, all in, in itself. Um, so everyone who got named, J. Cole got named, Mac Miller got named, R.P. Mac Miller, Matt got named, Big Crit got named, um, J. Electronica and Big Sean got named, and Sean was kind of in his feelings, but not really, but the main person who was in their feelings about being named in this verse was Drake which leads us into the matter that we get into. And then it leads into first person shooter. First person shooter, Drake and Cole. Um, first person shooter, Cole mentions the big three, which at this, which at this point, it's pretty much, it's pretty much a fair assessment to say that the big three and hip hop for this era is Drake, J. Cole, and Kendrick Lamar. Right. So fair, that's a fair assessment. Um, and, and J. Cole was saying it in just that manner. Um, funny, funny piece of funny piece of info that has been proven to be true. Um, K Dot was actually asked to be on first person shooter. And he said no. Which probably leads us more into the the situation that we are in in right now because you don't hop on first person shooter, but you definitely hop on like that, and you stay on like that. MF the big three, nigga, it's just big me, <laughs> like, and 
everyone like but it, there's a lot of other things that were said within these verses and so we get to we we get to um Cole putting out um seven minute drill mm -hmm. then Cole getting on the Dreamville stage and apologizing for putting out seven minute drill and then taking down seven minute drill and then Drake puts out push-ups and then we get to the point where Kendrick was like like that was just a throwaway verse you took the bait the person that I really wanted to take the bait took the bait took the bait that's it I, I, I hooked you <laughs> I got you and now we get euphoria it was very euphoric and then from euphoria drake was like okay family matters um and and mind you y'all we're gonna deal with a lot of the stuff that's within some of these songs because it's it's a lot um and so then family matters happens and everyone thinks Okay, that's it. Fam family matters. Family matters. We good. Nah, nah, nah. Not at all. Not at all. Nah, that's not it at all. Um, You're in fact not good. <laughs> that's not it at all. Oh, I'm sorry. No, even before we get to family matters, Kendrick comes with six sixteen in L.A., which was dropped at six sixteen in the morning Pacific time. And, and 616 has so many nuances to it. We're going to get into those, too. So then after 616 was Family Matters. And then after Family Matters was Meet the Grams. Oops. This is where we take a turn for something else. This, this, is, something, this is something else. Um, and then literally the next day after Meet the Grams, we get... They not like us. Like, so tell so Mr. Bullard. Um yeah. thoughts on the current situation that we are in with Mr. Lamar and Mr. Graham. Because at this point, it's it's just them two. Jermaine yeah. is well riding his bike around in peace and tranquility, his his mental health intact, and we the fans of hip hop are ever so scrambling. Um, having both Drake and Kendrick Lamar's IG and YouTube subscribe to, so when they drop something, we get notifications. Your yeah. thoughts? <laughs> well, first and foremost, as a longtime hip hop fan, uh, beefs on wax, you know are necessary for the culture. Um, and a lot of people don't appreciate that because it really forces the artist to challenge themselves. I mean, these are, yeah, these are diss tracks, no doubt. Um, so whether it was, you know, Juice Crew versus Boogie Down Productions, whether mm -hmm. it was, you know, um, Nas and Jay-Z, whether it is lesser known beefs uh, that, still created classics like Ice Cube versus Common, right? Like, um, they're just, it feels like every now and again, you need that. Um, what I really like about this for those two artists in particular is we live in a world where it feels like anybody can snatch a track, put some lyrics down and put out EPs or a whole album, call themselves an artist. So trying to create that distinction between who's at the top of their game and who's not feels very muddied a lot of times. Um, so I just want to put that out there uh, from jump um, that these are definitely necessary parts of the culture. It's very interesting watching people like have whole diatribes about <laughs> who's who said what and this, that, and the third. It's, for me as a hip hop fan, I think it's beautiful. Um, 
I'm going to be honest, I have a bias um, in in this, uh, is that I'm a, I'm in the lyricism camp of hip hop. Mm-hmm. Some people are more of the, I like a vibe, give me a good beat. I'm not necessarily concerned about the words. Um, and if that's what you need, so be it. But for me, uh, what Kendrick Lamar has been able to do and what feels like less, you know, like less than a week, <laughs> right? Is like, it, you know, it's it's almost, I can only equate it to like when you're watching a movie and it's one of those psychological thrillers and you can't quite figure out the plot. Yes. But then something pops up and you're like, I didn't, I didn't expect that plot twist. I didn't see that one. Like how did, like how did the, how did the killer know? <laughs> how did the killer know you was going to walk in that room or how did the killer know you were going to, you know, make this decision. It's almost like, uh, like the Saw movies. Like there's nothing you could do <laughs> to, to get out of it. And so that's the thing. It's like, I really do feel at this point, the best Drake can do is to walk away. Only reason I say that is because I really do believe, you know, to use uh, a gun analogy, Kendra's got more more bullets in the clip. <laughs> he just, it just feels that way. It feels like this is what it is. I mean, and the thing about it, thing that I, I appreciated about all of it was it was like a telltale sign that we would tell each other. It's like he's basically like check your crew because I shouldn't have this information. Yeah, it's like the things, yes. I'm, the, the nuggets I'm dropping on you are nuggets that I information I shouldn't have, and the fact that you don't have comparable information about me means that you got the wrong kind of people around you. Mm-hmm. And it was just like, for me, that was the like, bro, like the man, the man ain't just trying to dish you. He's just trying to tell you to like clean your house up, man. Cause you know, kudos to you, you know, your, your wealthy superstar status, you're doing all these things. That's great. You're selling out shows. Amazing. But the thing I've always appreciated about Kendrick, whether, you know, him start with top dog, or, or breaking out a little bit more independently as of recent. Right. He's always kept it tight. You've never heard about hangers on in the Kendrick Lamar camp. It's never been about this like 100 people, entourage, nothing like that. It's like, mm-hmm. I keep it simple. And so for no other reason, that's, that's the lesson I take away. And I just want to let Drake know it's like, it's cool. The beef is healthy, but also take some accountability, bro. Like, <laughs> oh. yeah. And, and, and so honest. And so for me, um, the, this beef also shows the, the dichotomy of the two sides of where we're at in hip hop right now. Um, Drake, so full disclosure, um, most people also most people also know this. I'm an artist. Um, I occasionally give y'all good. I occasionally give y'all good raps and and good songs. Um, I say okay. I say occasionally because I kind of like been nose deep in this organizing situation. So that you know, there's that. Um, the the dichotomy that we are in in this current era of rap is um, who can make hits versus who can make very poignant, very poignant records. Um, it's always been, it's always been since this current era of hip hop, and I like to call this current era of hip hop the um, freshman era, the the freshman cover era. Because most of the people that we've considered to be like really top, top guys in this era have all been on freshman covers at one at one time or another. Wale's been Wale's been on a freshman cover. 
Uh, Meat Mill's been on freshman cover. Big Sean, Absol, um, Drake. Drake was the only person who had not been on a freshman cover. Um, and that was that that was to the fault of Double XL. So then a month after that freshman cover, they literally gave Drake and Nicki Minaj they own cover because everybody was like, y'all really should put Drake and Nicki Minaj on, on that year's on that year's freshman cover because they deserve they they deserved it. Um, so with me having the platform that I have, I'm I'm going to say some things that people think just because I haven't said them recently during this beef on Facebook or or Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, wherever you follow me at, that this isn't the case for me. But if you've had conversations with me, you know this to very much be the case. I have always stated that Drake is the greatest songwriter and is the greatest songwriter in hip hop. The man can write some songs, save all of the ghostwriter allegations, all of the things very early on in his career. Not only was Drake writing awesome songs for himself, but he was writing awesome songs for other artists. Um, and, and it's it's like it's very well proven. Drake isn't in Drake when he when he doesn't try to cater to whatever the current wave is in in rap when he just sticks to what to who he is as drake to the guy that writes very poignant introspective rap songs is one of the greatest song is one of the greatest songwriters in hip hop i've always said that family matters the Family Matters, the song that comes after Euphoria, before Meet the Grams, uh, after Euphoria and 616 and before Meet the Grams, is an awesome song. It's a great song. Like, it's going to get play. It's going to get play in the clubs. Like, Drake knows how to make hits. Right. Drake absolutely knows how. Drake absolutely knows how to make hits. He's very poignant at making hits. The two things, the two issues that I had with Family Matters is you continued the, you continued the path that you were on with push-ups in that Kendrick Lamar was not the only artist that you came at. You came at everyone else that was, that was doing stuff about it. Fine, do that with push-ups. But by the time we get to Family Matters, that should not be the case on Family Matters. You shouldn't have said something. You shouldn't have had anything to say about ASAP. You shouldn't have anything to say about ASAP Rocky. Um, you shouldn't have had anything to say again about Rick Ross. You kind of could have really just let that one slide. Um, you know, because I know you has you felt like you had to say something to Ross after Ross dropped. His his this and then was just running around on 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 the social medias constantly and consistently still doing the thing. Um, you shouldn't have said anything about future and metro again, because by that time that everybody's out of it. The only person that's still coming at you is Kendrick. And the only thing that your core fan base wants from you is to. And let's let's end the talk. Let's end the speculation. Cole apologized. So when Cole apologized, he pretty much put himself out of the equation. Cole is now officially number three in the big in the big three. Cole is now number three in the big three. Right. Um, from a from 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 a black from a black male perspective, let's let's get into that. From a black male perspective. I applaud Jermaine for what he did. If you felt like this was going to disturb your peace, and if you felt like this was going to affect your mental health in any way possible, cool, wonderful. I appreciate that. From a from a culture, from a culture perspective, 
someone who critiques the culture and someone from a, a regional perspective that considers themselves a, a gatekeeper of the culture, bro, why you apologize? Can't apologize, brother. Like you've so, spent so yes, yes and no. Yes and no. Um okay. I always I gotta give a little pushback is because you know. The apology tracks with the trendency that J. Cole's been on, right? Mm -hmm. um, and this kind of brings it back to the Kendrick, uh, Kendrick Drake thing is that for both of these artists who are contemporaries of one another, they've been able to carve out particular lanes for themselves and be equally successful in those lanes. Right. So for Drake, knows how to drop a banger, knows how to do a club, you know, club hit, you name it. Like, that is his thing. Whenever he drops a song, it's going to get millions of streams and, and you know, folks are going to fall in love with it. For Kendrick, it's always been about whether he wanted to do this or not. It is the critical acclaim that comes with his style of writing, style of production, his ability to uh, to do that. And so, again, I don't, like, you know, whether it's Section 80, Good Kid, Mad City, or To Pimp a Butterfly, or Damn, um, I don't think that was his intent, but I think people have been so lacking of somebody who's so intentional about their writing um, that even like normal music critics who probably aren't even big fans of hip hop are just like, damn, like there are people out here still write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like they still write, they still produce and people still have an appetite for it. Now the real reason I bring all that up is because I think when all the dust settles, and, you know, for the culture, we can sit there like, who comes out on top? Who who's does does this? And this is going to be my hot take on this, right? That one. The exclusion of the names that have been dominant in the culture for maybe the last three years from this, from this ecosystem, for me, is the, is the hot takeaway. Because <laughs> there's no the baby references. There's no little baby references. Mm -hmm. There's no, you know what I mean? Like all these folks that have been like, you know, kind of dominant and in the space over the last, you know, three to five years, uh, kind of uh, showing their, their level of influence are uniquely missing. <laughs> like even in the, exercise of saying is the big three. It is Kendrick acknowledging here are my here are my other two contemporaries. Here's what it is. And so that's what I think is so masterful in this is that for Cole, he could have easily gotten into the lyrical scuffle. For him, it's like, I just produce great work. You know, I know my fans. I know who's coming to Dreamville. I know how people people view me. So I'm cool. I don't need to, to jump into any major controversy. For Kendrick and Drake, though, I really do believe it's almost like Marvin Hagler, Sugar Ray Leonard, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier. It's on some, on some level, there may be some, some I, I don't like you there. But at the end of the day, when those, you know, when Muhammad Ali fought Joe Frazier three times, it was to establish themselves as the two greatest heavyweights of the time, period. I'm sure Ken Norton, I'm sure, you know, George Foreman, I'm sure all, you know, all these folks could have made the argument that they were relevant to the time period. But there is no 1970s boxing without Ali Frazier. Right. Absolutely. And so that's that's what I, you know, from a historical context, that's what I'm loving about this moment. And even in Cole's acknowledgement, he's like, I know my lane. 
I'm not going to, there's a battle I'm not prepared to win, nor do I want to win. Right. And so that's why I'm, I'm going to fall back. Right. Um, and for me, the, 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 the slight issue I, I had with that is like, for the last five, this for the last five years, I'll just give you five. For the last five years, you've went on countless tracks and been like, anybody can get it. Da da da, da this, that, and the third, which that's like that's the spirit, that's the spirit of hip hop. And so for us in the culture, I think the main thing that we were really expecting if Kendrick and Cole went at each other, that it was going to be more of a lyrical it was going to be more of a lyrical jousting. Who's the best out of, who's the best out of the two of us? We all automatic, we all already knew that Drake and Kendrick was going to be something else. Like we all knew that was going to die. We all knew that was going to be something else because it's been, it's already kind of been brewing to be something else within the last couple, within the last few years that they've been that they've been at each other um and so for 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 Cole for the last five years has been like anybody can get it blah, blah, blah. put M on your head now you Luigi brother blah, blah, blah. like you know and then the whole year last year you popped up on everybody's tracks and you was you were you were murky everybody on their tracks <laughs> like like nobody really remembers a lot of the things that drake said in first person shooter because we all remember cole cole got on there did what he did um right. nobody really remembers Lil yachty's verse on the recipe because cole gets on there and does what he does like you were doing all of this so when so when all of these things happen and then Kendrick Kendrick calls you out in a slight way um and, and now we understand it to be like bro you just caught you you caught strays for the eventual person he was really calling out but when you got called out it was like oh game time like we 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 about to get we about to get Cole and Kendrick first before before we get the inevitable and you apologize. God bless. So, um, the so the other piece to that's just recently been really coming up within these songs between Kendrick and Drake is the and and I and I said to y'all. There's always going to be some sort of political discourse, political or social discourse that we can talk about, even within the Black culture topics, is the anti-Blackness factor. Um, a lot of people think that Kendrick calling Drake out on... Um, a lot of people think that Kendrick calling Drake out on we don't want to hear you say nigga no more, things of that nature is calling um calling Drake out on his biracial, biracial identity. For those of you all that think that way, you are really processing this from a very surface level because Jermaine, because if, if we're gonna get into that, then we gotta then again we have to go back to we have to go back to J. Cole. J. Cole's J. Cole has a whole white mother as well. And that's not the approach that Kendrick was coming at with J. Cole. The, uh, the real genuine approach that Kendrick is coming at when it comes to Drake is the fact of Drake's lack of addressing. Lack of addressing black issues when when they occur within the community, and Drake seemingly always using black culture as a way to validate his blackness, 
And there's a difference be and there's a difference between that and just allowing who you are in your blackness to shine through. Because as we always state, uh, as we always state in these organizing spaces, black people aren't a monolith. So you can still be the person that you are without having to, even in this most recent, even in the most recent song, Not Like Us, he literally gave everybody a, a, a whole history lesson about Atlanta before he stated that um, Drake literally uses Atlanta artists to validate his street, to validate his street cred within the culture. You, you, you use, you use Future and Metro. You use 21 Savage. You use the Migos. You use two, you use two chains. Like two chains essentially was like the first one out of the bunch that they got used when he popped up on problem. Then you use Migos when Migos had put out Versace and you jumped on the remix. You use the future, you use future. And the thing about it was some of these artists were starting to see that they were being used for the benefit of keeping relevance within the culture. And it got to be it got to be an issue, along with other things, you know, m- money. It's always a thing. Money's always a thing. Well, so, well, listen, I appreciate you bringing this up. Um, because a lot of people be like, you know, because it's so many layers deep when you think about that. But for people who are Drake fans, and this is no, no knock on folks being able to progress, move through, you know, associate themselves with the culture. But it goes back to to you bringing up the freshman cover piece, right? Mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, Dre's foray into the entertainment business is wheelchair Jimmy on Degrassi, right? (laughs) Right. So you, in the normal, in the normal progression of hip hop, artists in terms of their introduction you rarely ever see an artist make that kind of jump so as an example if a member of the mickey mouse club decides to spin around and a couple years later become the hardest you know rapper in the game the culture is going to call that out right right um and that's the way it always been so for somebody who's coming from the tradition of Compton rappers, like Kendrick Lamar is, right, where you, where your street cred is literally having to be established through gang culture. Mm-hmm. Like it's good. Like that, people forget that. Like NWA used to get called out uh, for, you know, for failure uh, to be connected to, to street culture. People don't, you know, this is pre-social media, right? Um, right. In terms of calling out the legitimacy, the reason that Easy E becomes a foundational member is because he's the only member of NWA who had sold drugs. <laughs> everybody else, everybody else was artist, right? So that street credibility is built through him, and then given to the Ice Cubes and the Dr. Dre's of the world, who were musicians, you know. Um, but we're trying to do something different uh, in that reference. So the reason I'm, you know, just just naming that and why it's important, you're naming this is I really do believe, and this is just, again, you know, my opinion, right. um, that Drake suffers from a level of insecurity not having that legitimate foundation in hip hop that a lot of folks do. That So for all the money, all the fame, you're still walking around looking over your shoulder because it's like, damn, I got, I got a whole TV series of me, me (laughs) rolling around in a wheelchair, acting with glasses on, being like this thing. And then all of a sudden I show up on a mixtape and it's different. And again, that's cool. But to your point, I think he attaches himself to people who have a more kind of legitimate hip hop trajectory 
to give himself, you know, that street cred. And people people aren't going to like that, but you just got to acknowledge that's what it is, right? right. Like, because yeah. when we think about hip hop, you know, it's it's drug dealers reforming themselves, becoming rappers. It is, right. it is street, street cats, you know, becoming that thing. I mean, even if they weren't like illegal sellers, they had like regional specific credibility, right? Like mm-hmm. Andre and Big Boy are Atlanta. <laughs> you know, Run DMC were Queens, mm-hmm. you know, like and Drake's coming smooth out of the six in Toronto, which was new. <laughs> and and, no. and it's always and it's also it was also stated, and this isn't the first time that it's been stated, but it's all it was also stated how much Drake Drake uses, and I'm, I'm putting that in air quotes. Drake uses his father and his 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 father's connection to Memphis as a, as a way to attach himself to some sort of some sort of re- regional cu- regional culture within the states. You know, his father being Dennis Graham, who's who one of his relatives is Larry Graham. Another one is Willie Mitchell, who is a famed producer with Al Green. Like, it's just a lot of, like, Memphis connection in there. And it's like, oh, you know, Drake also uses uses his father as a as a means to, to, to validate some sort of attachment to some type of Black, Black culture. And so I, I wanted to bring that up because it was like, I've seen a lot of why is... Why is Kendrick diving into colorism during this particular beef when that's not the case? It literally is. You are you are essentially doing what you do best. You're an actor who is portraying a I'm rapper. rapper. <laughs> right. You are an actor who is portraying a rapper, and you're doing and you're doing a very good you're doing a very good job at it and then on the, on the flip side drake is also addressing the i guess anti-blackness factor within kendrick by stating hey so you know this whole pro-black persona that you give that you're giving people isn't really um isn't a real thing for you because you know you have infidelity issues with white women and you know your current your current fiance it, your current fiance is 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 half black, and then of course the whole um, the whole you you rapping like you're trying to free you rapping like you're trying to free the slaves line in Family Matters. I just I, the flip side of how Drake is addressing this issue is not in the best context when. Um, Kendrick's whole argument that he is standing upon is the fact that you're essentially being a caricature of what the culture really is. And it's all it, it's almost to the effect of like you're you're proving you're proving him right. And 100 percent And this, yeah. and this, but this has been, and again, historical context matters. If we want to make the argument that Drake's been around as a influential hip hop artist since 08, we're talking about Drake's been around through Black Lives Matter, through Ferguson Uprising, yep. <laughs> through, you know, George Floyd. And you never really hear anything come from him. And of course, his defenders and fans, well, oh, he's a vibe. We just want to maintain the vibe. It's not a, not everybody's got to be about that. You know, hip hop history would argue against that, that at some point during major moments of inflection, even the most mundane hip hop artist still held the 10 toes down the paint. You know what I'm saying? Like, Lil Baby, Lil Baby really gave us a whole uh, a whole joint during this this George Floyd uprising yeah. with the big picture. Like listen, MC Hammer. 
got on a gun violence. Got on, <laughs> got on. We all in the same game. You know <laughs> like MC Hammer got on a track with multiple West Coast artists to address uh, gun violence in the, in, in the West Coast community. Like, come on, like, you know what I'm saying? And then I know we're both donning our kafias, so there's all the the concerns around, you know, Drake's inability to eat, you know, take a side. I mean, if you want to, you know, portray your Jewish identity and stand, you know, stand with the state of Israel, say that. Or if you're going to call out that, but you can't act like you're not impacted either way. Right. Because your own ethnic and racial identity is tied to the conflict that's happening. You know what I mean? And so when people are like, what's up with that? Mm -hmm. Um, And the absence of that voice, these are the things that kind of bubble up. And it's like, it's, Kendra's not wrong for taking advantage of the moment, but he's also, you know, really, and again, going back to some of the previous comments, he's really not necessarily on some, I'm going to call you out for the sake of calling you out. It's really an accountability thing that if you're going to be the hottest selling artist in hip hop over the last 10, 15 years, and you have no track record of here's what it is. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's I mean, at the very least, like, and in going back to the whole big three, big three situation, um Cole was in Ferguson. Cole was in Ferguson in the middle of the uprising, and then uh-huh. gave us. Um, gave us a song free. Kendrick essentially gives us Kendrick. Kendrick essentially gives us the anthem of the entire movement. Right. With 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 all right, and and and, and let me be honest. When "To Pimp a Butterfly" came out, I didn't see that one coming. Like I, I didn't. I didn't see. I didn't see because I listened to the album when it when it first dropped. I listened to "All Right." And I was like, yo, I'm like, no, this is like a pimp. This is like an incredible, this is an incredible song. I wish they drop a video for this. They dropped a video for it. And I was like, yo, cool. Word. And then Movement for Black Lives convening happens. The 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 young kid gets the young kid, they trying to arrest them in Cleveland. All of the all of the M4BL organizers that was at the convening is preventing the the cops from trying to arrest this kid for absolutely no reason at all. And then when the cops go away, the first thing that comes out of everyone's mouths is, we going to be all right. And I remember, because I was married at the time, I remember being in the house because when when me and my wife first got married, that was our song. That literally was, all right was our song. Um, Because we were just like, yo, like, we in our first couple of months of marriage was getting hard on this. But one thing you mean, you got to know, babe, like we, we going to be all right. We going to be all right through all of this. And when I show her the video, show her the video of the organizers chanting, we going to, she was like, she's like, Jamil. I was like, yeah. Like, I was like, bro, I was like, bro did it. Like he, he just give us, he just give us a hit. He gave us a whole anthem. And it's like, we're not asking you to be out in the streets, masked up, marching with us, but like, come on now. Diddy's one of the Diddy's one of the biggest capitalists in, in the game. Like, let's let's be clear on this. Diddy's one of the biggest capitalists in the game. Jay-Z's one of the biggest capitalists in the game. And Jay-Z and Beyonce gave a gang of money to build protesters out during the Ferguson uprising. And they uber capitalists. So like, let's, let's be really clear on this. Like at some point, people who, people who lean to the opulence and decadence of what hip hop culture has had, has transitioned into have still contributed in some way to the overall culture of who we are as 
as Black people and for you to not even have breathed on one of these issues, much less even give some sort of statement around it, speaks to how how you just want to be involved, how you want to be involved in this culture, and it speaks volumes to the overall um, the overall standpoint of of this beef. Um, and, and and my conclusion of it is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the, Drake, don't it's done, brother. Like, don't don't say anything else, because I promise you, like. Bro got a couple more in it. So no, so so last point, then I'm I'm be done with this particular point. I, I listened to Joe Button. Joe Button was on um on with academics um last night. I heard it this morning. And Joe Button's whole thing was Drake can't do the I'm putting out, I'm gonna put out a song that sounds like a hit. That's a hit. He can't do that anymore. Like he can't do that anymore because Kendrick just did that. It, like not like us essentially is gonna be one of the songs that they're gonna play in the club during the song. It's a foregone, it's a foregone conclusion. Um, same, same with family matters, but you can't do the I'm making hit song anymore. Joe Budden was like, yo, you gotta do on your time stamp songs. Like Drake, Drake is Drake is the king of the time stamp songs, 6 a.m. in, in Dallas, da, 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 in this this piece. Um Joe Bunn was like, we need a we, we, we need a 7 a.m. or 1 p.m. in Compton. He was like, we, we need one of those. Because on those songs, he was like, Drake raps. And when you when Drake gives us the 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 rapper guy Drake, like that's what the culture wants. So for me, essentially, my feeling is if Drake does the timestamp song and he gets on there and raps. Cool, you you back in business. But the problem with that is going to be Kendrick got the nuke. I I feel like Kendrick has not gave us the the the, the red button song. I don't think Kendrick has gave us the red button song yet. Which is scary because it feels like there's a natural progression in all the songs he's dropped, right? So it's just like, and that I think is what worry like i say worries people it's like it's both this worry and excitement at the same time because you're like what is he holding back Man. you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> what is, if he's saying this now what else is that? but but the problem because the, other, think, the other piece of this is meet the grams one of the things that stated in meet the grams is that drake's hiding another kid on an 11 year old daughter which had which literally hours some people are just finding this out today at the the day that we're recording this episode but some of us within the culture found this out hours after the song was put out that that was proven to be false and it was proven to be false because of the fact that either and this is my opinion either one the mole that kendrick is talking about is actually somebody that's working alongside drake to make kendrick feel like I'm on your side, but Drake's feeding him information and Drake got, I mean, and Kendrick got got or Drake is telling people within the camp stuff and Drake eventually finna find out who the mole, who the mole is that's going back to telling Kendrick stuff. Either way, Kendrick got some false. Kendrick got some false information, and the way that we all know that Kendrick eventually found out he got false information is because the cover art for Meet the Grams is no longer the cover art. If you go on Spotify, Apple Music, like it's just a blank, black, blank, black square, like how all of the corporations did during 2020 when they felt like they wanted to be on our side. I'm I'm petty, Dwight. Like it's 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 petty. Understood. Understood. I think that's also <laughs> um, a beautiful segue. <laughs> <laughs> so um, but yeah, like if you if you give us if you give us 6 a.m. in Compton, Kendrick is gonna give the nuke. Well, the the one last point I wanted to raise on that though is the problem with a timestamp song that calls out 
a region that is so inextricably tied to hip hop means that you also bring on the ire of that entire region. Mm -hmm. And what I do now, like, do a timestamp song. If you want to call them out for living out in Rancho Cucamonga, do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But don't call out Compton, because that means that the game going to dust off (laughs) his notebook. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? And that's, and that's the other and that's the other thing that people that people don't realize because another thing about hip hop culture is if you go out if you go out to LA and you know you're going out to LA to deal with rap to deal with rappers rappers and MCs in LA, um you gotta put that OG call in before you get off the plane. And if you do 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 1 p.m., 2 p.m. in Compton, that OG call gonna be a little hard. To, to put in when, when you, you might not be able to get off that plane, brother. Like, listen, like, listen, I just, it's a thing. there but, are a lot of people waiting on the bench for you to, for you to try and call out the region. And that's the <laughs> thing that's like, what I appreciate about Drake in terms of his regional representation is with the exception of, you know, longstanding folks like Cardinal Ophishow, uh and, and some of the more like hip hop slash reggae folks that have been around Toronto for a while. Right. Drake is it, you know what I mean? There's no long-standing comeback, but yeah, don't don't do that. Bro. Don't don't <laughs> do that. Don't don't call out Compton collectively. <laughs> and that is, and that concludes our what we talking about segment, which was a very good one. Um, I might have had. Um, so let's get into it. Dwight Bullard on the show with us. Thank you for joining us once again and indulging me with your time, good brother. So this is how we begin this portion of the show. You have two top fives. The first top five, since we have already dived into all things hip hop and hip hop culture, who are your top five MCs? It can either be of all time. It can either be at the moment, but who are your top five MCs. So, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be controversial, but I do want to give context that my love of hip hop tends to get stuck between 1988 and 1998. <laughs> well, the, greatest, um, the greatest era of hip hop. Yeah, like some, you know, <laughs> what they actually call the golden era of hip hop. Um, So I just want to give context that my top five are MCs that really, for me, define that era. Mm -hmm. Um, But I also know we just talked about Kendrick Cole, Drake, and the like. And so, you know, if I was to open it up broader, there might be more names. But my 88 to 98 top five (laughs) uh, is, uh, you know, no no particular order, uh, Notorious B.I.G., uh, Hove, uh, you know, Jay Z, um, Common, you know, shout out to Chicago, um, Andre Three Stacks, uh, and uh, because I was born in Philadelphia, shout out to Black Thought. That's great. That's a great list. I <laughs> have so, so on this show, I have yet to not name my top five, and I figured since I knew this was going to be a thing that we were going to discuss in the what we talking about segment that I would name mine. Um, And these are my top five that have like really influenced not just me as a person, but also me as an MC as well. Um, Mine is Stacks. So Stacks always going to be number one. I'm, I'm biased. I'm from it. I'm biased. I'm from Atlanta. I have some. I have some sort of a tie slash connection to to the Dungeon family. Again, R. R. P. to my OG. Um, but like, I'm from Atlanta. So there's that. Um, second one is gonna be Scarface. I feel like Scarface is the greatest storytelling MC of of all time. That was proven to me when I went and actually seen Scarface live during this tour that he that he's that he was on with the with the Tiny Desk Band when they came to Jacksonville. Impeccable, 
concert. If you've never seen Scarface Live, and if you want to see Scarface Live with the Tiny Desk Band, I, I indulge you to do so. Um, so, Stax, Scarface, Nas. Um, the two reasons as to why I'm an actual MC right now is because of Outcast Southern Playlistic Cadillac music and the cultural influence that it had over the city of Atlanta. And when I saw the video for Nas's The World Is Yours, I was like, I want to be an MC. I want to do that. I literally want to do that. Um, so yeah, Nas, shout out to Black Thought. I feel like Black Thought is, I, I feel like Black Thought still is the most underrated MC in, in the game right now, but that is slowly not becoming not a reality anymore. Um, because thought is impeccable. Um, and then my number five is Kane, Big Daddy Kane. Um, and reason being is because the the Brooklyn swagger of Biggie and the swagger and wordplay of Jay Z, you get none of that without the impeccable style and swagger of of Big Daddy Kane. I've always loved Kane's swagger. I've always loved Kane's style and cockiness. Um, you know, whenever you shoot a video dressed in a double breasted suit, but taking place in a boxing ring, that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's style. That's style and swagger, like, and that's always that's always been Kane for me. So those are my top five. Yeah. Um, next top five is top five black social or cultural leaders that have put you in the space that you are in now as an organizer. Oh man, how do you how do you limit it? Well, first and foremost, it's always going to be Malcolm X. Um, that's always my answer to. Uh, who would I want to have dinner with? Um, there's one person I can have dinner with, hands down. Would love to pick the the brain of El Haj Malik El Shabazz. Um, mm -hmm. uh, after that, um, yeah, I'm like shuffling around uh, because some folks kind of popped in more recently. Just as I've done a deeper dive, one of those people is like Ella Baker. Mm would love to really like have watched her work um, as an organizer, especially somebody who really pushed for youth uh, engagement. Um, so uh, definitely shout out to Ella Baker. Um, W.B. Du Bois uh, is another one. Um, and sticking with uh, people who got their PhDs from Harvard. Uh, <laughs> Carter G. Woodson uh, would be number four uh, because Miseducation of the Negro was really a defining book in kind of understanding, you know, the psychology, especially Black folks, um, good or bad. Um, and then lastly, I won't say lastly, but, you know, uh, the works of MLK um, and what he was able to accomplish, um, whatever your criticisms of him might have been, there was a there was a rhyme and reason, right uh, behind how he operated. Absolutely. Um, for me, MLK is one. Um, again, I'm from Atlanta. Right? They we they you get taken through a whole week leading up to MLK Day of learning about Dr. King, and then the last day of the week. And this is when you're in elementary schools. At least that's how it was for me during the time period I was going to elementary school long, long ago. Um, but yeah, you, you you get taken through a whole week of learning about MLK. And then um, that Friday, the last day of the week of school week, they take you to the MLK Center. But we, you know, we always, that was always the thing. My second one is Ralph David Abernathy Jr. And it is because while I was in the first grade, um, going to Atlanta public schools and and learning about learning about Dr. King, I saw a picture of um, Pastor Ralph David Abernathy in a book, um, history book in school, standing next standing next to Dr. King, 
I told my teacher, I was like, yo, I know him. And my and, and my teacher was like, yeah, that's Rap David Abernathy. He was Dr. King's right. I was like, no, like I know him. Because at the time, um, my grandmother, um, who just passed away last year, um, she was the kindergarten Sunday school teacher at West Hunter Street Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And at the time, she was the Sunday school teacher. The pastor of that church was Ralph David Abernathy, Abernathy Jr. So anytime I ever went to church with my grandmother, I didn't realize the person who was in the pulpit giving these sermons is essentially the guy who helped Doc, who stood side by side with Dr. King doing all of this stuff. So upon finding that out, um, the next time I went to the church with my grandmother, um, I spoke to him and told him, I was like, hey, so we learned about you in school today. And so he was like, all right. And it's like, and it, and it just, that just became a thing from the time I knew until the time he passed away. Every time I went to church with my grandma, we sat in his, his office in the church for like maybe five to 10 minutes. And he would just tell me stuff. He just tell me That's stuff about, about the movement. So uh, Pastor Abernathy is two. Um, the the incomparable Kwame Touré is number three. Um, I I have tried to really pattern my organizing style after after Kwame Touré. Um, it's incomparable. And just recently in 2021, I read Black Power. And like tra- changed my life, changed my whole outlook of how I wanted to approach approach organizing. Um, number four is um, Fannie Lou Hanger. It's, it's always gonna be Fannie Lou. And and number five is Malcolm. My dad, my dad actually took me to go see Malcolm X the first day it dropped in theaters, and I sat there. And that's a three hour and twenty. That's a three hour and twenty one minute movie. Yeah, twenty one minutes, absolutely. Yeah. I sat there for the entire three hours and twenty one minutes, and we walked out of that theater, and I was just like, "Wow!" And then my dad was like, "You know, that whole thing is based off a book." And I was like, and he handed me the autobiography of Malcolm X, and the rest of that weekend, because I would always go to my dad's house on the weekend. The rest of that weekend, I literally was in my room in my dad's house reading the autobiography of Malcolm X and the whole thing changed my life. It just, it just, it changed my, it changed me. I was just like, this is completely different than what schools and the news and everybody used to tell you who Malcolm X was, how bad of a person he was. We should just really lean on the teachings and the principles of Dr. King then you grow up later on and find out that they completely washed, whitewashed how King was. It's just a thing, man. Like, like if it's don't like, don't wear rose colored glasses when you when when you're a black like, person. White supremacy is real, brother. I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I, got a, I got a quick Kwame Torre story that I think you'll appreciate because it's similar to your Abernathy story. So. Mm-hmm. I taught high school uh, for a number of years, specifically uh, Black history is one of the topics that I taught. And so uh, the church that I grew up in um, asked me to to do a Black history sermon, talk, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, And so unbeknownst to me, I'd seen this lady a thousand times. So the person who organized the event was like, all right, um, so, uh, do you know who Stokely Carmichael is? Of course, I know Kwame Ture is Stokely. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> well, so his mom uh, goes to this church. It was like, excuse me. Like, you know, mind you, I'm sitting there like, <laughs> I've been in this church for years, right? Like, and this sweet lady had no clue that she's Stokely Carmichael. So she's like, first pew as I'm trying to give this like black history lecture like and uh and uh long story short after it was done uh the fact that she like held my hand and thought that I uh gave me the highest compliment of basically saying that um uh, her son would be proud because it's after he had passed mm. uh, and I was like 
that just happened. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a real thing in life. Right. Like, yeah. Because yeah. Yeah. Like, because the crazy part about my it was it was like Pastor Abernathy dies. My 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 grandmother went to his funeral, and and Miss Juanita went walked up to my grandmother after the funeral, and she was like, she was like, yeah, so. Um, me and Ralph used to talk about your son, your, your grandson a lot and just be like, yo, like he's like, he's like eight, nine. She, he was like, he can't be no more than nine or 10 years old, but he want to know about everything that me and Marty did. It's like, I don't know what he going to do with his life, but he going to do something that's going to change the course of how we move in this world. And, and that still sticks with me to this day and like everything that I do in every way that I move as far as like organizing and just the culture period is concerned. Like, I just feel like I just, I carry that. I carry that legacy of a lot. Um, so I, but that's crazy. Like Kwame Ture's mother, like, like I saw her on, I saw her on the black power mixtape. He was sitting <laughs> on that couch. Next to his, and you saw her like ah, oh, yeah. That's, it was around her on a on a month of Sundays easily, and I just had no clue until until that moment. <laughs> so being from Philly, um, how did you and the family initially end up in in Florida? Yeah, so born in Philly, um, unfortunately. Uh, you know, this is, this is, uh, you know, around the, the rise of Reaganomics, World War crack, <laughs> mm-hmm. the supposed war on drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, Philly got ravaged, um, especially the, uh, community I was grow- growing up in. Um, uh, my mom had, uh, decided to divorce at the time. Um, and my grandmom had, uh, relocated. Uh, to Miami, she worked in the mental health field, and so my mom wanted to start a start something new. So she, you know, took me on a jet plane, and um, and the rest, as they say, is history. I, I jokingly tell the story though that when I think about the theme to Fresh Prince of Bel Air, <laughs> if you put that in the four year old context, same thing happened. <laughs> right. You know, like they always well, tell us. The, I used, to get, I, used to, I used to get picked on uh, by older cats on the block. <laughs> um, so, so my mom decided, uh, but went with me. She didn't send me to go live with my uncle and aunt. <laughs> She's like, I'm coming. With, I'm coming with you. Coming with you to, to Miami. Um, so interesting, interesting piece. The out of five guests that we've had on the show, the the two men um, that we've had on the show have a history in, within Florida politics. Um, your dad served in, in the House and your mom served in the House and the Senate. Um, and so... Where, where, as far as your family, where does the, where does the tradition, I don't don't necessarily want to say tradition, but just more so the, the passion and desire to be public servants through um, legislative means, like, how does, how does that come about and how does that play a how does that play a role in the makeup of who you are not not just as an organizer but also as a legislator during the time that that you were in yeah um you know total shout out to the badass woman that was my mom uh who was kind of the 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 foundation layer uh of my political understanding my political ideology um, even though, you know, argumentatively, I probably am uh, much more to the left than she was. 
<laughs> um, or than she wanted me to be. But the problem is she was too good of a teacher. Uh, so so uh, her political journey really kind of begins in uh, Philadelphia. Um, my uncle, who I never had a chance to meet, uh, was murdered by a white gang um, in defense of his younger brother. Uh, so one of those classic examples of you were on the wrong side of the street. So my my uncle, uh, my uncle JD, had um, wandered into a white community, got into it with some with some white guys. Uh, my uncle Tyrone went to go defend him, and ended up being stabbed uh, over thirty times. Um, and so my mom's political journey begins as an advocate for her family, trying to find justice for her brother. Uh, what that means, though, is that uh, you had white folks at the time who were very adamant that these that these young white men weren't going to see any jail time for this injustice. Um, and so my mom was like, under no circumstances are we going to just act like this didn't didn't happen. And so she became kind of like the chief advocate in making sure that uh, these brothers were brought to justice. So when I think about like, you know, the arc of Black Lives Matter, the arc of police accountability, Trayvon Martin, et cetera. Yeah. That was her well before social media. Um, and I remember growing up, cause she had like a, a photo album of the articles that were like the chronology of it. And I remember reading it and just like not fully appreciating that but you know it's they were you know had death threats uh the black panthers at the time uh provided safety and protection for the family uh just because of the nature of the racialized nature of what was happening and so from that point on she was uh involved in formal politics uh she wanted she made sure uh that uh, a particular district attorney got elected who would help get uh, those, you know, get those folks brought to justice. That person would then eventually go on to be the mayor of Philadelphia, mayor of Philadelphia and uh, eventually the governor of Pennsylvania. Hmm. Um, but she helped him on his first campaign. Uh, then she moves to Miami. <clears throat> and a lot of people don't appreciate this about Miami. Miami hasn't always been this like, you know, cultural enclave of South America meets the Caribbean, blah, blah, blah. Especially where we grew up uh, in South Dade, it was still agricultural and white. <laughs> and so she decided to run for office as a Black woman in 1984, running for a seat that had never been held by a Black person, uh, let alone a Black woman. Um, so I decided to jump to a race with, you know, multiple white guys and her. Um, and that was kind of her first taste in running for office. Um, she would again run again in 1990 and then was successful in 1992. So she's really the, the catalyst mm -hmm. uh, that helped me understand uh, what it meant to run a campaign, what it meant to be in politics and just being, being observant, you know, without, you know, if I want anybody to walk away with anything on whether you decide to run or not uh, for office, pay attention to what's happening. Because what I was able to do learning from her was just to watch. Watch how people move. Watch how people show up. Watch how people prioritize things that they want. Watch how people will fund things that they want funded and not fund things they don't want funded. Like all mm. of that was, was me learning those lessons as a, you know, when she uh, won her first seat, I was 15. So watching that happen um, was, uh, was the kind of learning that you can't pay for. Okay. No, absolutely. Um, and so in, in watching 
and in watching all of these things that your mother has done has done within the state legislature um when does it become what becomes the aha moment that puts you in the space of this is how I want to move like like I I feel like this is the space that we're going to be in now and I want to make that move into into state politics because the other other thing is you know most people they'll do state politics for a little while and then they'll try to move up the ranks into into the federal sphere and that's something that like you've never done like you've always kept it right here in in florida um so what was that aha moment like for you well you know it's a matter of impact and influence right like I think a lot of people get captivated by federal politics because they watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox or what have you. Mm -hmm. Uh, They hear about members of Congress. They hear about the president. Um, So those are names that they know. The names that you don't know are the ones that have the most impact on you. Um, And so when you think about state level politics, uh, and again, uh, you'll hear me invoke my mom a lot. Uh, She used to speak to like classes and she would ask like a question like, what, you know, what do you think is something that isn't influenced by state politics? And so she tell, used to tell this story about how a kid, you know, trying to be smart was just like, well, you know, when I go to the bathroom, that's not impacted by state politics. And she was like, you're wrong. It's called waste management. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, but she used to say that to drive the point home that a lot of people don't fully appreciate the decision-making power and the impact uh, that state lawmakers have on your everyday life. Um, But even more dynamic was kind of like how she moved about the business. One thing about, you know, Black people, um, but especially Black women, uh, is they can be disarming Mm -hmm. and that can be their superpower. And, and that's what I watched my mom do for almost 20 years in the legislature was like, have this level of outsized influence as a double minority, if you will. Right. Like you're a black Democrat, black woman, Democrat in a body. And, And mind you, when she started, Democrats are still in control for a few years. I know it's hard to believe, but yeah, that that was a thing. But just like watching her move and what was still predominantly white male dominated uh, space. And one of the things that like, because I I love history, but one of the things that I, I really took away from how she moved, right? And I remember her telling me this as someone who was born in South Carolina is where she's from originally. And she's like, what a lot of people don't appreciate about white men is that they've probably been raised by black women. Old white men. Mm, (laughs) They've probably been raised by black women. And so she's like, once you understand that about them, then you also understand how they operate and they move. And so that used to be the thing where she would just be like, you know, I see her be stern and say something to somebody, you know, somebody else would be like, how did you say that? She's like, she said, because I said it in the volume that they're used to hearing it from the lady who raised them. <laughs> and I knew they was going to get some act right <laughs> if if I said it in a particular tone or tenor. And I was like, yo, <laughs> that's what's up. So, but to answer the question, how does that impact me was, I also understand the psychology of how they view black men. Mm. And so people always talk about the notion of viewing black people as insignificant politically, but they're also very much scared (laughs) of black people. So it's like, yes, I want to restrict your funding. I want to restrict your rights. I want to do these things, but I also don't want you to punch me in the face. 
<laughs> like that's it's a weird dichotomy, right? It's this it's yes. this weird the dichotomy where it's just like I want to say I'll, you know, when it's me and the 50 plus one percent keeping you from getting your rights, I, I can talk real big and bad. Mm-hmm. When you look at my face. And I think you might swing. <laughs> I think you <laughs> might just swing on me. <laughs> That's it. That's it. That's a, and so that one-on-one dynamic versus the the bigger, uh, you know, I guess the bigger, you know, political dynamic that we tend to know is one of the ways I chose to operate when I was in the legislature. Mm-hmm. One thing, and again. Dealt with some racist mofos uh, in the legislature. But one thing they always said about me, and they oftentimes said it in comparison to my other black male counterparts, was they were like, I don't agree with you on much, but I respect you. (laughs) Because you don't, you know, there's no compromise (laughs) with you. (laughs) You are, you're like, here's what I believe in. Here's what I need. I'm not going, I'm not going to flirt. I'm not going to kiss your butt. I'm not going to cajole. I'm not going, you know, and it was very much like, you don't want me at your house. I don't want to be at your house. So before we, so we ain't got to play this game, right? (laughs) (laughs) So that, and I, you know, I try to remind folks of that because people sit there and act like, oh, you know, they'll sit there and be like my good friend. He's not your good friend. They're not your good friend. Like, come on now. <laughs> like, you ain't never getting invited to their cookout and you don't want them at yours. So why are we playing this game? I just need you to understand what I need and what my community needs. And if you don't feel compelled to do it, my job as representative is to make you understand why, what the needs of my community are equal, if not more important than your community. Right. First off, um, way to way to effectively utilize the stereotypes that, that's always used against us. Um, you gotta flip it on his head sometimes. <laughs> that part. And I've always said, and I've always said that when, when, when we're together sometimes, I'm like, you're, you're a very domineering guy. Like, but I feel like in, in some in some cases, most people don't know that in in most cases, not all, in most cases, completely opposite. Like it's like Dwight's awesome. Like Dwight's Dwight's very nice until you cross him. But like you know, nobody knows that. Like, <laughs> so like I, you know, since since I know this the the Black FLA podcast, right? Mm-hmm. I remember one one legislator once said he's like. I don't know how you just called everyone in the chamber a cracker without <laughs> using the word cracker, but you, but you did it. <laughs> He's like, and the thing about it is you did it. They know you did it, but because you didn't say it, they can't say you said it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. Coast, just like, is a beautiful thing. It's, it, like, it, it it's, is. A, it's a skill. Not everybody. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's a dynamic skill. Um, so you were actually in office um in the in the senate matter of fact when these group of kids like we just call them kids like so we just, just call them kids these group of kids decided they were just going you know step up in step up in the state capitol and take over yes. the state capitol for 30 plus you know for 30 days yeah no, for 30 days how how was the climate? Um, because I not I had not I knew about the Dream Defenders, but I had not really gotten like involved involved with the Dream Defenders until 2018. But I had always really I like, really wanted to be a member from that moment on. So how was like the dynamic of the Florida political structure at that time, because like Trayvon was the year before, 
Then we have the trial and the acquittal. Um, and not only are they coming in to do this 30 day, to do this 30 day sit in, but they're also coming in with Trayvon's law, essentially trying to repeal this long standing law that's been on the books in the state of Florida, the, the, the stand your ground law. So, um, yeah, explain how that, that moves and maneuvers from yeah. a legislative perspective. Yeah, yeah. The other side of the fence then. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely glad you invoked Trayvon Martin. Most people don't notice because it's it's very much a thing I do myself, but uh, you'll see this. I, I never take this particular wristband off. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it says, you are Trayvon Martin. Uh, I am Trayvon Martin. And it's... Uh, and it was actually given to me by uh, Miss Sabrina Fulton. Um, so it, it doesn't come off the wrist ever um, for a reason. Um, and that's because, you know, I think everyone talks about their, like, you know, catalyzing moment. And for me, that was it. I was in the house uh, when Trayvon Martin is murdered. Uh, the world felt like it was on fire. Yeah. Um, and, you know, not, not to, you know, throw salt or shade on, on anyone, but the fact that Trayvon was killed in this state, uh, I felt that our, our response, our collective response, uh, as the Florida legislature was subpar, uh, insufficient, um, and I just remember like being there watching it, watching it transpire. And just to give a context so people fully appreciate, a year before, uh Casey Anthony uh had had become a thing, right? And I just yeah. remember all these people talking about, you know, this poor six-year-old girl, her mother. And so I'd never seen legislation move that quickly, but because the legislature was so up in arms over the 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 killing of Kaylee Anthony uh and wanting to make sure that her mother was brought to justice mm -hmm. so from trial to legislation took less than a year for them to pass a bill fast forward Trayvon Martin is murdered everyone's pointing at stand your ground as 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 one of the causations of it so everyone's like, there's got to be same way, same, keep that same energy, right? Like, right. y'all just did this thing for her. You know, this 17-year-old boy gets murdered. There's got to be some sort of modification of staying your ground. And actually, there was more of a doubling down mm. of it, right? Um, so what that did... Uh, was create a collision course uh, between what would ultimately be, you know, Dream Defenders, BLM movement, <laughs> and all the things. Because at that moment, I, you know, that's when I drank uh, a big old cup of effort uh, and just decided that it's it's not cool enough. It's not. Uh, sufficient enough to try and nibble at the edges. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, you know, 2012 election happens. I get elected to the Senate. First bill I file is a full repeal of stand your, stand your ground. <laughs> also file a, a, a partial repeal of stand your ground. Cause I was yeah. like, I'm gonna give you both. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here's what it is. Right. Um, but then, of course, uh, the George Zimmerman trial happens. He's acquitted. Um, and we can talk a little bit more about, like, even the aftermath of that, because it was, yeah, it was just a lot going on that had my head spinning. And it just so happened that these dynamic group of young people, um, many of from the campus of the Florida A&M University, <laughs> um, decided to start this organization to 
to really like shed light uh, on the humanity of Trayvon Martin, um, but really the humanity of uh, of black people um, who had been historically mistreated by the state of Florida, who had not been viewed as whole and not been treated. And so, yeah, when they took over the Capitol, I, listen, even though I don't consider myself super old, yeah. I was proud of the courage, proud of how they showed up mm -hmm. and made a commitment that whatever they needed from me, I was going to be able to do it. So I was happy to spend a night or two uh, hanging out in the Capitol with them <laughs> uh, at that time. But um, I was just happy to be a part of what I felt was uh, an important part of history. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, and, and we'll get into another in, important part of history in, in, in just a minute. Um, so after all of, after all of this occurs, there is a delegation of delegation of people who go over to, to Palestine. Um, you are one of those individuals that is within, with, that is within said delegation that, that heads over to Palestine. In the midst of this, um, it is, it is, it is revealed, um, that, the the tour guide of this delegation is um Muhammad Jetta. And you know, you now get labeled all of these things. You're in code, you're in cahoots. That's it. You have a person good. in this in the state senate that is in cahoots. I was terrorists. Um and as soon as you come back from, from this delegation to Palestine. Um, the state legislature passes a bill to um, prevent the state from doing business with companies that are essentially a part of the um, anti-BDS movement. Um, so let me, it was actually the inverse, right? So they start um, passing that legislation uh, in really kind of 14, 15, and 16. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a continuum where the state of Florida kept uh, trying to push uh, for what they're calling anti-boycott divestment and sanctions legislation, basically saying that uh, any company that capitulated to, to a boycott movement, uh, an anti-Israel boycott movement, uh, would not be able to do business in Florida, which mm -hmm. is, let's just be honest, illegal. If you're right. going to be, if we're going to be upfront about it, right? And so, again, as I mentioned before, I taught social studies. I'm not saying I'm a constitutional lawyer, but I have a, I understand the basic tenets of the First Amendment. Yeah. Um, and one is that uh, boycott is protected speech. So it, the, the controversy starts by me as a senator asking simple questions in a committee because everybody just, you know, legislation moving quick, you know, and of course there's the political dynamics because the sponsor of the bill is going to be the Senate president in the future. And, mm -hmm. you know, so everybody, and I'm just like, you know, again, like I mentioned before, I had already drank my big cup of effort back in 2012. So I just didn't have the time tolerance or patience <laughs> for the BS anymore. Right. Um, and so I was sitting in these committees and I'm just like, so let me get this straight. Is what you're saying is that people who participate in the boycott, that we're vilifying those that participate in a boycott. <laughs> and they were like, well, and then of course they're trying to explain it away. I'm like, oh, is boycott not protected speech in the U.S. Constitution? Well, yes, it is. So explain this to me. 
we're the state of Florida. If somebody boycotts Disney, there's no law condemning them if they choose to boycott Disney. Or if Disney chooses to boycott something that's uniquely American, right? right? So if Disney says we no longer want to mess with Coca-Cola, you know, there's no penalizing Disney for choosing to do that. Mm -hmm. But for a foreign entity, <laughs> we're now creating laws in Florida <laughs> to condemn them. And I don't want to make it too convoluted, but I just like need to make it simple for people. Mm -hmm. It didn't make sense on paper. <laughs> it didn't make sense to me. And I found it very interesting that people were just like twiddling their thumbs like, yeah, well, you know, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> <laughs> here's what we're doing. And so, you know, it's flying through committee and I'm just like the only no vote. I'm just like, I'm sorry, it don't make sense. Mm -hmm. I participated in too many boycotts to all of a sudden come out against a boycott. <laughs> like, like, duh, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, yeah, what I didn't know is how controversial, quote unquote, that was. Um, marry that with being invited as a part of the delegation uh, in 2016 to Palestine. Um, that it would all kind of bubble up. But what I'll tell people is, is this. You know, I'm a I'm a believer in spirituality. So I'm always about the tiny of things mm -hmm. and and with that the meaning of those things. So the invitation comes at a time where people, you know, well-intentioned people were just like, Why would you go on a trip like that? Why would you go with these people? But it's like, listen, I've been rocking with the dream defenders this this long. Why would I stop rocking with them when they're in inviting me to go learn something deeper. The other part of it is, I think for most people in this country, you are, you're given limited understanding of what it means to be Palestinian, right. what Palestinian identity means, what the history of the quote unquote conflict is. Um, and you're given a super one-sided perspective in this country. Um, and it's not until you set foot on the ground there where you're like, got it, got it, got it. And we've seen in the modern context, people who visited, we're talking about Jewish folks, white folks, black folks, you name it, all basically saying the same thing. You don't fully appreciate the nature of the Israeli occupation until you're on the ground in Palestine mm -hmm. and see what is happening to people on the ground in Palestine. Right. To have an American passport and be treated fundamentally different than someone who lives in a space. Like, like I don't, think, you, I don't yeah. think people get that. Like you're walking around with your blue American passport and you have more rights than someone living in the West Bank in terms of freedom of movement. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. And to put it in context so people understand, imagine you living in Philadelphia and someone telling you that in order for you to leave Philadelphia and go to New York, which is, you know, two hours away, you have to go through multiple checkpoints. And the fact that you could be denied access to New York just because, oh, and you got to make sure you have your passport with you at all times if you're going to travel to New York. For most people, that'd be like, that's that's insane. I, I mean, New York's a, you know, it's right there. It's another state. It's a, it's agreed upon things. So if it's if you view that as if that lack of movement as insanity or unjust, then you also have to understand why it's inherently <laughs> problematic for the people of Palestine to be treated the way they have uh, for the last 75 years. Yeah. And so in that, in this current, um, in this current uprising within 
within Palestine and with and across and across the country, we've had countless um campus encampments that have had that have um surfaced across the country. Um, even some here and in the state of Florida. Um, I want to give I want to give a lot of love and love and props and respect to the the Jacksonville 16, um, 16, 16 protesters, um, nine of which were students who um, helped to build this encampment on the greens of the University of North Florida and were arrested um, this past Thursday, released on released on Friday, all of them released on Friday, um, but all of them are facing all of them are facing charges, which could essentially give them a year probation um, or fine up to year probation, some time either some time in prison, a year probation, or, or, or up to a hundred thousand dollar fine, um, simply for protesting. And the students, some of them face either suspension or expulsion from from school and so I, I, I think for for those within the Jacksonville 16 put for me that's something that I commend them for knowing and understanding the consequences and yet understanding that there's an even greater consequence that's happening to the people over in Palestine um as, as we've already faced 30 plus thousand people that have been killed, um, Palestinians that have been killed since since October. And, um, you know, countless organizations on the national and speaking just from a state level um, have called for have called for ceasefires and, and things of that nature. Um, but the 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 punishment that the the Jacksonville sixteen have have currently faced um, pales, and once again, I'm I'm using using it in, in air quotes, pales in comparison to what's happened on USC's campus, what's happened in UCLA, what's happened in Columbia, what's even happened on USF and USF and the University of Florida's campuses. They've face abuse on top of you know the charges and things that they have um that they currently have faced knowing what you've seen and going over to Palestine and understanding the dynamics of this decades long conflict that has had so many iterations of intifadas that have occurred. Um, what is the thoughts? What is the thought that goes through your head as you see these encampments that currently happens, and knowing that all of these encampments are student led, student driven, and you know we're once again put in a time period where lives are being put on the line for the sake of making sure that all of us are free because none of us are free if we all ain't free. Right. So, so many thoughts, but the, but one of the things I want to make sure is known. And I, you know, I always talk about history because I'm a history nerd. Mm -hmm. There's never been a student-led movement that's ended up on the wrong side of history. Internationally, or nationally. So we're talking about Tiananmen Square in China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> talking about the Arab Spring. <laughs> we're talking about, um, you know, the Freedom Riders, SNCC, uh, Students for a Democratic Society and their anti-war protests, the anti-apartheid movement. Uh, against South Africa. These have all been student-led movements 
encampments, sit-ins, uh, calls for divestment. So I say that because of people are watching this and are choosing either neutrality or quote unquote, don't understand why these students are doing what they're doing or saying what they're saying. Mm -hmm. This is 100% shade. You are part of the problem. <laughs> you are part of the problem. Uh, because you don't, that means you're not paying attention to what the ask is. And let's think about this. Right. 37,000 plus Palestinians in Raza have been killed that we know of. Right. 70% of whom are women and children. Even with the quote unquote 30% uh, that are men, when they're saying that, when they're talking about we've killed X amount of Hamas fighters, understand how they're skewing that number. They're basically saying that any male that they kill, age 12 or older, they're calling a Hamas fighter, even if they're not a Hamas fighter. So any numbers, that the Israeli government then generates to say these are Hamas fighters, it's inconclusive as to whether or not these people were members of Hamas to begin with. Exactly. Right? So you're already getting, you know, so you're already falling for the banana and tailpipe as people are just trying to, you know, prevent themselves from being, you know, go through mass starvation and, and overall genocide, right? So you're, you, that that in itself uh, is is a challenge, but I think the other thing that bothers me, and I got to get this off the top of my mind though, because you brought up USC, UCLA, Jacksonville, yeah, is in many cases the sheriff of Jacksonville is black, the mayor of New York black, mm -hmm. mayor of LA black, and that really gets under my skin that people who come from a marginalized tradition would inflict violence on those trying to seek justice for marginalized people. Like, you know better. And I'm, you know, Karen Bass in particular, right? And I've been a fan of Karen Bass, right? She comes out of organizing she comes out of, you know, anti-Black racism mm -hmm. and organizing herself through, through the prism of that. So for you to give the green light to have harm inflicted on those students on those two campuses bothers me. Eric Adams bothers me. Yes. Uh, it's a lot uh, of things about Eric Adams that bothers right. me, but you we, know what I mean? we'll just, just touch on this. Yeah. And the reason I bring this up kind of like my third point is it's the internet intersectionality of our shared histories, right? Like we understand white supremacy is a problem. We understand that white supremacy invites other groups in to inflict harm on those that have been, been marginalized. But the, the real job is that they somehow convince people who had their heads kicked in that because you're not getting your head kicked in this time, that it's okay to jump on board with the kicking of somebody else's head, right? Exactly. Um, and it's like, the, it feels like the oldest trope in the world, but somehow people keep falling for it as if somehow it's going to be better for you. You know what I mean? Like for Black folks that got all you know, hot and bothered in 2020 about racial injustice who are choosing to be silent now. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going to happen when the when the police decide to shoot another unarmed black man? And, and for organizers who right. for organizers who involve themselves within within our movement, it speaks to the lack of political education as it pertains to the solidarity that black organizers have with Palestinians. And it's just, it's mind boggling to me that we can quote, um, and, and, and I'm speaking to the Black organizers who don't want to involve themselves in any way, shape, form, or fashion within this current movement 
in Palestine, right. we can quote James Baldwin, we can quote Fred Hampton, we can quote Huey P. Newton, we can quote Angela Davis, not understanding that all these people that I just named, that I've heard you all quote countless times, have quotes standing in solidarity. With like, the, like, I, man, listen, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, that's the thing. Like your Black History Month favorites. <laughs> yes, literally. Right? Like, <laughs> like, like when you start naming the names of people who've made solidarity commitments to the Palestinian people, you're talking about Malcolm X. You're talking mm -hmm. about Angel Davis. You're talking about the Black Panther Party. Holy. <laughs> you're talking about, you know what I'm saying? Desmond Tutu, Nelson Mandela, right? Kwame Torre. So yes. many, so many folks that have, that have, uh, been saying this before it was popular to say it. So yeah, anybody who, who's who got a Malcolm X poster on their wall was choosing to be neutral in this moment. Like, miss me with it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, all I'm saying is like, check yourself. And I'm not, yeah, I mean, I wish I could sit here and be like, well, you know, but not, it's, it's like, there's no there's no space for the notion of neutrality in the in the spirit of injustice. Exactly. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like there's no symmetry to this thing. Like even when you hear about Israel's got this war with Hamas. Okay. Let's make the argument, but Hamas is a political organization. The people of Raza are the people of Raza. They're not they're not the same thing. <laughs> Why? So, so you can't then make the argument that uh, the Israeli government is fighting Hamas with this like collective punishment that they're using against the people uh, of Palestine. It just it just doesn't hold up. You know what I mean? Like the math ain't mathing, as we say in the culture. <laughs> and I'm, I've I've already reached out to. I've already reached out to people. Um, so it, it should be known that our second half of this season, of this first season of BLK FLA, the podcast, it, we will we will have an episode where we dig a lot more into um the 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 genocide of, of those over in Palestine and why it should be a thing that we as black people, especially black people in this state, like they, they, 2018, now let's be clear, 2018, they, they tried to butcher, um, then gubernatorial candidate Andrew Gillum over the fact of his, um, affiliation with the Dream Defenders because of the, the anti-BDS movement that, that was occurring. Um, yeah. And I'm glad you glad you brought that up and not to, you know, think about it too much, but it's just like what I don't what I don't like is how people try to undermine and dismantle people's entire sense of humanity or career. I know we kind of glossed over quote my, you know, quote unquote my controversy and stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm not gonna sit there and say it wasn't difficult to live that experience. But the idea of shedding light on the humanity of another group of people doesn't necessarily mean that you're condemning an entire other group of people, right? Like, and that's the thing. It's like, let's just talk about humanity, right? Whether it's Haiti, Sudan, the Congo, Palestine, or anywhere else, people should have the right to live, right? Without persecution. Mm -hmm with a level of freedom and understanding. And that is, you know, really what's at stake as the through line. And, you know, we, I start off by saying student movements have always been on the right side of history. Yes. Part of that is when, when you look at the core principle and value of what they were doing, they were calling out simple injustice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> simple injustice. I should have the right to go to this school. I should have the right to be 
you know, I should, you know, we should have the right to not bomb the people of Vietnam, Vietnam and Cambodia right. uh, with impunity uh, for no justifiable reason. And again, history proves itself now because people will sit there and be like, well, we were doing it then because, you know, we were anti-communist. So now we've normalized relations with Vietnam. And they've been normal for the last, what, 30, 40 years? Mm -hmm. So so how do you justify the fact that we still have unexploded ordnance in this country, meaning bombs we dropped (laughs) that didn't explode, that they're still finding today from the 1960s and 70s, (laughs) making Laos and Cambodia some of the most dangerous places to be for that reason? There's some accountability there. And that's the through line, because if we're using American tax dollars, right. American weaponry to wage war against these people, you can't come back 25 years down the line and be like, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> my oh. bad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we weren't, I guess, you know. <laughs> I guess, that was, I guess that was a thing for us. <laughs> um. So in bringing in bringing up Jacksonville 16, also um, also want to bring up and and like I said, we come back to another important point in in history. Um, so 2023, last last year, 2023, May the third, 2023. Yep. You as the senior I'm free. <laughs> you as the senior policy advisor um of Florida Rising, along with 13 other individuals, walked to the governor's office in the state capitol seeking a meeting with said governor. And when the meeting was denied you all decided that it was best if you did an hours long (laughs) sit-in at the state capitol, resulting in you being one of the Florida 14. 14 brave, valiant souls who said, these maps you drew, these bands that you are putting on education, DEI, and, and just all of just the things that you've done as the governor of Florida, um, two black people, two two black and brown people, it's just essentially wrong. It's just it's just it's it's garbage. Um, you you knew the risk. Um, you knew the risk. Um, as as you just stated, <laughs> you're, you're free because <laughs> this is a nice, gave you a nice little year long ban. Like the, this is a building you cannot step in, brother. Like the, mm-hmm. don't don't come up in here. Um, a building <laughs> that you have been in countless times mm-hmm. as a legislator mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. organizer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, like everybody don't everybody knows Dwight. Like former legislators, current legislators, they all know the white bullet. Like I yeah. Um define the mind frame that goes into the decision, want that goes into the decision to do this, and what are lessons learned from the I, I'll just call it the can't ban us. It experience of 2023, which not many people know this. Um, there were scattered conversations that were happening at the beginning of the year that leads to this. Um, and one of and one of those scattered conversations was a conversation that you and I had um after we came out of the um stop the black attack meeting that happened after the initial press conference in January. Um, Because I basically was in the meeting. Like, I was in the meeting and I was just like, look, y'all can do these. We can do these letter writing campaigns, all of this. They're not going to, they're not going to listen to us and get the 
seriousness of this until somebody gets arrested. Like people got to get arrested. And then two days later, I get this phone call from Dwight. And it was like, you mean this people got to get arrested stuff, don't you? I was like, yep, sure do. Then let's try to cook something up. And then eventually yeah, we yeah. get to May 3rd. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, appreciate you being a thought partner and all of that because, uh, you know, people talk about like the end result or the tactic. Um, as if it was some sort of short-sighted kind of thing. Like I just woke up on the, you know, the morning of May the 3rd and was like, today's the day. Yeah. <laughs> um, that wasn't it. Like the consistent attacks. Well, let me just get it off my chest. Ron DeSantis is trash. We know that, right? That's what. <laughs> so, um, but what was, I think, alarming for me, especially was he was riding a wave of a popularity, right? Um, and popularity that goes unchecked um, could be bad for everybody. And it had already been bad for Black people. So, you know, once he got reelected in 22, and even before that, he was consistent in passing trash bills, uh, basically condemning everybody, Black people, LGBTQ plus folks, uh, immigrants, uh, women, <laughs> like you name it, everybody got the smoke from his administration. Um, and basically, if you weren't a cisgendered white male uh, who uh, who was of a polit but specific political ideology, there's something that he's passed uh, that has made your life in Florida uh, more problematic, right? Um, and people need to know that. Um, and so part of this was to shed light on that. Um, uh, but again, context, historical context is important at that time, even before May, 2023, mm -hmm. because he's riding that reelection wave from November, 22, gets sworn back in for his second term and basically positions himself as the leading presidential candidate for the Republican Party. And people act like, oh, it was all, it was a foregone conclusion that Donald Trump was gonna get. Nah, nah, buddy. <laughs> like there were there were serious talks that serious the consideration. Was be the guy. He had raised over a hundred million dollars uh in preparation for this huge launch. You know, he had uh problem child number two, Elon Musk. <laughs> as like one of his biggest financial backers. So it was like, there was a lot going on. And it's like, so what can we do to, to you know, take some wind out of his sails? You know what I'm saying? Like, what's going to be that thing yeah. that gets people to understand that he ain't it, right? Um, and people are always like, well, what was the impact, this, that, and the third? Sometimes it's, Sometimes it's important to A, be the bucket, B, be the drop in that bucket mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, that gets it done. And that's the thing that um, I was happy to be a part of. Me and my 13 counterparts who decided to hold it down, it felt like a very full circle moment because it was me and members of the Dream Defenders back in the Capitol again. <laughs> Literally. Um, you know what I'm saying? And it's conveniently 10 years uh almost to the date <laughs> uh, that uh, that the uh, Occupy of the Capitol had happened. So it was, you know, it felt special. It felt right, you know, being banned from the, you know, I didn't lose any sleep <laughs> being banned from the Capitol for a year. <laughs> you know, people ask me, you know, how did I sleep? With my thumb in my mouth. Yes. <laughs> With a baby. Right, With a baby, okay. <laughs> unbothered <laughs> but yeah i was um again i'd do it again just like visiting palestine i'd do it again if, if you ask me to do it again i'd do it in a heartbeat <laughs> last question for you which is always the last question of the of each episode um white bullet what is your vision of a florida 
where Black people are able to live in freedom, equity, and authenticity. So knowledge is power. You know, uh, I have no problem being one of the people on the front lines, you know, trying to combat systemic and institutional racism, trying to pull the bricks out from the the systems that prevent uh, access uh, and opportunity for black people. No problem if, you know, being being one of those folks. But what I need from the folks who are choosing not to be on the front line is a better understanding of the fact that these institutions exist mm -hmm. and how we must find newer, better ways uh, to either go through, go over, go under, or go around uh, those impediments, right? And so, uh, you know, there's an amazing uh, former professor, Florida State University, Dr. Naeem Akbar, you know, shout out to his, uh, son who's uh, been the, the movement lawyer for a while, Mutaki Akbar. Yes. Doc, Dr. Naeem Akbar published a book called Breaking the Chains of uh, Mental Slavery, right? Um, easy read. The reason I say easy read is because sometimes people just need a good starting point uh, on how to understand how the vestiges of white supremacy impact us how we show up, how we think, how we undermine our own ability uh, and greatness mm -hmm. as a part of it. And the reason I say all this um, is because in order for Black people to be free, we have to begin to be free mentally. I've invoked mi miseducation of the Negro. Uh, you know, and there are just so many books, you know, Chancellor Williams, uh, Friends for Known, so many authors who published impeccable works on helping Black folks understand where we've been, helping Black folks understand where we can go, but reminding Black folks that we've always been great. Yeah. And that is something that is too often lost because too many folks want to root us in this notion of enslavement. Um, and even in the, and even in rooting us in that, understanding that enslavement means that we were the literal building block of American capitalism. So even if you are a black capitalist, my argument to you is the folks aren't even acknowledging the role that your people have played in the very thing that you're trying to support and uplift, right? So understand that you're the, the reason. You're the, you're the swagger. You're the whole thing. But for those who believe in a liberatory mindset, like you and I, we also got to get out of our own way. Right. We got a lot of generational trauma, a lot of institutional mental barriers that we hold on to a lot of insecurities, a lot of taboo BS around, you know, going out and seeking therapy, you know, about feeling as though apologizing to one another is soft, you know. And so all the things that we need to do in terms of reestablishing trust amongst ourselves, all the things that we need to do in terms of uh, making sure that we... Um, can thrive as a people uh, are oftentimes on us uh, to imagine a world that is so great. I kind of leave with this, right? I think part of the reason why people love Black Panther and why we showed out in 2018 when it dropped yeah. was many of us don't appreciate what Afrofuturism Afro Afro means. It means the ability to think about <laughs> Freedom without restriction. So Wakanda for us, subconsciously, even for the less woke folks, was like, yo, Black folks could have, imagine what Black folks could have had 
if blah, blah, blah didn't happen. Right. I'll challenge you even more. Black folks already had it. <laughs> we just got to get it back. <laughs> and that's the thing. That it's not a question of Wakanda could have been. It's a question of Wakanda has been. We got to study and learn, build, and change the game. Because, you know, King T'Challa and Mansa Musa are the same person. <laughs> literally. Literally. And I and I and I've been I've literally been waiting for someone to and in any time I ask that question to bring the Afrofuturism concept within it, because that's literally essentially what this movement is built upon. It's built upon a it's built upon a framework of Afrofuturism because I always tell people, um my definition of Afrofuturism is envisioning a world for Black people that has not and is currently not tainted by colonization or white colonization or white supremacy. And so essentially every time this question is asked to people, it is pushing, it's pushing Black people's brains to envision a world that is not tainted by colonization or or white supremacy because you have to you have to actually literally do that in order to see black people be able to live in freedom equity and authenticity um so i really really want to thank you for not just bringing that in but just being in the space with us on today and just honestly being in the space in Florida, period, because you are a valued asset to the movement at large um, here. So I appreciate it, bro. Listen, I appreciate you, uh, you know, creating a platform where, where Black folks can be authentic. So don't uh, don't lose sight of, of the mission. Appreciate it. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, we need spaces like this. Yeah. So this is Jamal still showing y'all love and appreciation for joining us on the BLK FLA experience. Stay free, stay blessed, and always continue to get acquainted with greatness. We are out. Thank you.